Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hopefully going to convince you that there are there are um, some very quick ways to uh, to improve what you're doing. But um, what I thought I would uh, I would start with is is, um, is uh, recapping something I showed last year. If anyone anyone saw me speak last time, is actually looking at um, is uh, is email even still relevant? Um, there's a lot of talk of, of mobile. We've seen a huge uh, a huge amount of talk about that today. But I think it's interesting to have a look at what the the reach of the various different mediums are. So. We put these, these figures together, um, looking at everything from SMS right way through to all the different uh, major social media channels. And I think it's still um, very interesting to see that email is still bigger than every social media network combined. Um, it's absolutely dwarfed by the penetration of SMS, but it's still huge. Um, you've got somewhere in the region of 3.3 billion uh, unique active email addresses in the world at the moment. Um, so it far outstrips uh, anything else uh, available out there. And interestingly, 67% um, of marketers say that email is the highest returning uh, channel for their, market, uh, their digital marketing. So it's still extremely relevant um, in today's world. But what I'm planning to do over, over the next uh, uh, 30 to 40 minutes is sort of take you through um, some of the ways that you can easily improve your campaigns. We're going to have a look at um, some campaigns that are doing some particularly innovative things and hopefully I'm going to give you some ideas of, of ways that you can um, easily increase the yield of your campaigns because that's one of the things. It's, um, it's quite easy to... Um, it's, uh, as Thomas was suggesting, to uh, make mistakes with your campaigns, but it's also really easy to uh, massively increase the impact of them with just a few subtle changes. Um, so one of the first things I want to look at is um, mobile. And um, with all this talk of, of mobile marketing, I think it's actually worth pointing out, first off, that uh, email really is mobile marketing now. Um, the, the change in the last few years has been absolutely phenomenal. So if we go back uh, all the way back to 2011, then we're looking at something in the region of 27% of email opens were on mobile in, in 2011. If we go to today, the latest figures for this month, it's 47% wow. are on mobile. It's, it's phenomenal. And if we zoom forward, the, uh, the estimates are um, that's going to be 60% by next year. So e email marketing really is, is mobile marketing now. It's, it's the predominant channel for reaching people on mobile. Um, and what is um, absolutely staggering, I found, is that about 50% of mobile purchases are actually triggered by an email campaign. So in terms of mobile commerce, it's a really, really important channel. And the ironic thing is that uh, despite all of that, 33% of people are using mobile to screen their emails, so to decide whether they want to read them or not. 70% of users are saying they'll delete an email campaign if it doesn't look good. And despite all of this, 18% is the proportion of email campaigns that are actually optimized for mobile devices. So there is a massive opportunity out there to make your campaigns better and to, to get ahead of your competition. If you can optimize your email campaigns for mobile and you're in a position to fulfill that on your website, and there's a huge opportunity here. And it's really not that difficult to do these days. So let's have a look at a, a few ideas for how you can optimize things for mobile. Uh, and these really will actually, if you can apply them properly, improve your campaigns across the board anyway, because I think these, these rules generally apply, but even more so for mobile. It, it magnifies the need for these. So users have a really short attention span. Um, you need to make sure that you've got really concise, compelling copy you're really, really clear in what you want them to do and that you, you get to the point really quickly. You've got to respect the fact you have a really small viewing area. Um, you've got really high quality screens on these devices, but still the actual visible area you've got is very small. You don't have that much space to play with, which means that you need to have a really, really clear call to action um, and create a large interaction area. So you want big links, big buttons, make it really easy for people to, to click through and go and perform the action that you want them to do. And of course, you really need to make sure that your, your website is optimized for mobile as well, because people will be hitting it from there. So I want to take a, a quick look at a campaign that I think works really well for mobile. And uh, these guys, I think, do it exceptionally well. So it's British Airways, so you'd, you'd hope they've got the resources to, to apply this. But what they're doing is actually really simple. So this is their, the desktop version of the email campaign um, that they sent out. Um, Nice looking campaign, that was actually an animated GIF, I thought they executed this really well. Um, but their, their main um, links that people use most often are actually these little links down in the, um, the bottom left hand corner there. And if you view this on a mobile device, what you get is this, I think it's really clever. Um, so they actually make the buttons really large, really easy to interact with on your mobile device. 
Um, and that's actually pretty easy to do these days. Um, you can, um, you can use, utilize uh, templates, or you can have someone code it up so that actually these buttons will render differently if they're appearing on smaller devices. And the increase that you can get through on click-through rates from this is actually quite substantial. So it's well worth the investment in, in time to do that. Um, so I hope that little bit has just sort of convinced you that uh, mobile is, is something you, is, uh, you need to take really seriously for uh, email marketing. Um, I'm going to move on uh, quickly. I've got quite a few slides to go through here and talk about the next most important thing, which is uh, data. I think this is um, something where people overlook a, a lot of opportunities, um, particularly in the e-commerce space, actually. So what we find is that a lot of people are pretty good at, at capturing data from their buyers, um, you know, profiling that data. You, you're capturing it as a matter of course through the checkout. A lot of people miss um, opportunities to actually find clever ways to capture data from people before they become buyers. So to really make the most of the browsers you've got on your website, when they're just coming, they're having a look. They're not, they're not ready to make a purchase yet. And there's, there's quite a few really easy ways that you can um, make small changes to your website that will have a massive impact on, on your data and, as we'll, as we'll see in a bit, ultimately really increase your revenues as well. So um, this is one that was uh, implemented on a, a small, really niche e-commerce website. Um, it's a little data capture window. Um, it works in quite a specific way. You have to be careful when you do, uh, do this kind of, of data capture campaign, but when you execute it right, it can be really, really powerful. So um, it's a little overlay that appears on the website. It's not, it's not a pop-up as such. It's actually appearing on the page. Um, key things that, that make this work are it appears only once. So you will only ever see this, this pop-up once when you hit the site. Um, you won't see it until you've been on a page for at least 15 seconds. So you've been dwelling and, and paying attention on the site. You haven't gone through and clicked any, any purchase buttons. Um, it's got a compelling proposition. It's giving away free stuff. Um, it's very simply worded. Um, it, it's very easy for people to decide whether they're interested or not. And if they close that, that window, they're never going to see this, this pop-up again. It's gone. It hasn't interrupted their experience too much. Um, and interestingly, this gets a 2.4% response rate. Um, from everyone who sees it. And remember, they're only ever seeing it the once, and they're only ever seeing it really, really briefly. And these are people that would not necessarily have, have turned into a direct purchase. This has been really, really effective. The site that implemented this doubled their email database in a month after implementing this. Really, really powerful stuff. Um, but where you can really take this to the next level is by making sure that you use that data to actually turn those customers into buyers. And this is, again, something that, that a lot of people really overlook. Um, and the way you do this is to use welcome emails. These can be really, really important for your campaigns. They are the most read emails that you will ever send to your audience, absolutely guaranteed. Um, the stats that we see from our, our own platform time and time again, you get about four times more opens and five times more clicks from the welcome email that you send to your customers than you will do from any of your other campaigns. Um, so you need to do everything you can to, to maximize the benefit you get from these. Um, work up a really compelling subject line, give people a reason to open that email campaign there and then, and have a really clear goal for that campaign. So decide you might want to make it a purchase incentive. If people aren't coming to your website and converting straight away, have a, have a clear driver in there to go and uh, get them to convert to purchase. So maybe it's a, a free shipping or a small discount or an upsell offer. Alternatively, you can use that email um, to get them to whitelist you, so get them to add your email address to their address book, which means you don't really have to worry about spam filters for that user again. You will just sell straight into the inbox. Again, that can be really, really powerful. Or you can use it as a, an opportunity to gather additional data from that customer or to sell them further on your brand proposition, so tell them more about what makes you different and special and why they should listen to you. And if you do this right, I'll show you again. So this is actually the, the welcome email that's sent in response to that, that uh, campaign we saw just now, gets an 85% open rate. 52% of the users uh, click through from there into that proposition mentioned in the email. And we measured the direct revenue uplist from this email, so ignoring everything else. Every single, every single email that was sent from this campaign resulted in a further one pound and eight pence of revenue for that website. Every single email that was sent. Um, so it's a phenomenal um, uplift for ultimately very, very little work and something that, that really costs them next to nothing to do. Um, and not only that, but they're growing their database so they can remarket to these people over time as well. So it can be a really, really powerful revenue driver. So the next thing, um, 
Customers love promotions and discounts. Those kind of emails will always perform really, really well. But unless you've been very specific about building your business model to support that from the beginning, it's really hard to sustain in the long term. You don't want to train your audience to always be expecting discounts unless you've specifically geared your business around that. So how do you combat this? What can you, what can you do to optimize your campaigns if this isn't an option to do all of the time? Primary one is be worth reading have content that really engages your audience. Um, as uh, Seth Godin would say, you need to be remarkable. How do you go about doing that? Well, there's a, a relatively simple sort of few steps that you can use for it. it starts off by talking to people individually. Um, all, all too often you see a campaign that addressed to, uh, as though they're talking to a multitude of people. You're not with an email campaign, you're talking to one person. So make sure that you're writing your content and your copy as though you're talking to an individual. Add personality to your messages. Um, again, people don't want to buy from a, a, a sort of boring corporate impersonal message these days. People are buying from people regardless of, of uh, the brand behind the transaction. They want to talk to an individual ultimately. Really important is to make sure you've got something worth saying. Um, there is no point having an email schedule and just sending stuff because it has to meet your schedule, you will just alienate your audience that way. Make sure you've got something worth saying before you send your campaign. And if you don't, skip it. Wait until you do. Um, your audience will be all the more thankful for it. And really important is to remember that your audience don't, don't really care about you. They care about them. So make sure when you're framing stuff in your campaign, you're talking about how these things benefit them. What, why, why is this important to them? What's the benefit of them? to them of, of getting your campaign. Um, so I want to show just a, a couple of quick examples of, of companies that I think do this really well in, in very different ways. Um, so this is one I love. This is a, a, a small uh, restaurant up near Liverpool called the Monroe. It's just a, a snippet of their campaign. And they send things fairly um, irregularly, but I always think their campaigns are absolutely they're on the money. So not only are they saying um, you know, these are ways that they've got better for you, they've got really interesting copy, they're addressing someone as an individual, they've got a really specific personality behind the copy. It's a really simple email campaign, but it, it's quirky, it, it's, it's talking to that customer directly. I can tell you the results they got off these are really, really great. Like their, their open rates and click-through rates are, by comparison, they're just off the chart. And it's not difficult to do. It's like they haven't spent ages and ages designing this campaign, they just have focused on really great copy and really making it engage and resonate with their audience, and that can make all the difference. Looking at a slightly different one, um, we've got the English Cheesecake Company, so um, apologies to anyone that's hungry at the moment, but <laughs> um, they focus really on, on putting the, the brand and the, the sort of differentiation of their, their branding and their amazing products like right in the front of the email, and again, they spend a lot of time crafting really nice copy as well. Um, but the difference here is like this is all about following through their branding and making it really engaging for their audience and, and selling a lot of their amazing cheesecakes as well. So it's a, a quite a different approach to it. But again, not a, not a massively um, expensive one to do, just a, about understanding your audience and really focusing on, on what they want to see. Something else that um, is a really easy way to optimize your campaign, and we get asked all the time about um, is when's best to send an email campaign. Um, it's often a problem. You can really easily schedule campaigns for just about any time now, and it really can have a, a massive um, impact on your on your sales. And what we always warn people here is that it is actually right, really quite specific to your audience. So we find if you're um, like the clothing retailers and things that we work with, generally tend to find that actually Sunday is a massive day for them, um, which is counter to a lot of other industries. So the most important thing you can do is actually look at your own analytics and do some tests and analyze um, when you're getting the most click-throughs and opens on your campaigns. That will give you a lot of really valuable information. Um, but we realize that, that that's not the ideal answer for everyone unless you want to sit and, and do an awful lot of tests and you've got data to look at already. So uh, we looked at a few billion emails that we sent last year. Um, we sent about two and a half, three billion email campaigns last year. Um, we, we, yeah, we send a lot. Um, we, we send 50 to 60 emails a second, every second, um, throughout, the, throughout the day. Um, so we, we crunched these numbers, and we produced a lot of reports on these, and this is the, the sort of latest iteration of the report. We found that actually, um, time of day-wise, it, it breaks out like this. Um, so if you have nothing else to go on 
three o'clock in the afternoon is, is probably um, your best bet. That's certainly when we see the highest volume of, of uh, click-throughs and opens um, everywhere. Um, I'll just say at this point as well, if anyone wants a, a copy of this presentation, um, you can tweet at us with the, the hashtag below and we'll send you a copy after this as well. So don't feel you have to write down all these numbers. Um, there's, there's quite a few in here. And I'll put the details up at the end as well. Um, so yeah, there's, there's obviously a, a sustained peak sort of throughout the day. Interestingly, like the, the lunchtime, sort of one, one o'clock or so, is actually a really bad time to send. People don't tend to interact with that as much as they do later in the afternoon, um, which sort of goes counter to a lot of, a lot of uh, previous thinking. Um, and in terms of day of the week, it's Thursday. Um, again, quite, quite a substantial peak there, and actually a drop off on Friday again. But like I say, we've, we find that for specific retailers, Sunday can be really good as well. So do be sure to sort of test this on your own audience as well and look at, look at when the things are coming through. Um, but in general, yeah, um, Thursdays at 3 o'clock, if you have nothing else to, to go on, I would start with that and then experiment, look at your data and start to move things around. Look at also when your sales are occurring as well. So if you, could, if you can map out when your actual transactions are taking place, use that data as well to inform when you're going to send your campaigns. Because it can have a substantial impact on not only your open rates, but your click-through rates and your conversions as well. Um, that being said, though, there is actually an even better way to tackle this, um, something that we've been working on with a, a client recently, um, a, a big um, high street uh, chain that you, you've probably seen. Um, and we have this, this issue with, with them as well. But they, they have offers that they run at very specific times, so we can't really time shift the, the email for everyone. It wouldn't really, it wouldn't really be fair. Um, because of the way we do that, the offers. Um, but what we actually do do is let people decide when's best for them to get the email. So everyone will get the first email that comes through, and at the bottom they get this little box. Um, so what you find, you tend to find now, is obviously people get a lot of email campaigns. They will either interact with the campaign may immediately, maybe they'll save it for later, but you don't generally have that long to remain relevant in the inbox. So what they um, have offered the option of here is people can click a link in that campaign. And what this will do is actually schedule another copy of that campaign to be resent to them at the time they've selected. So if they want to be reminded about it the next day or the next week, they can click on that and it will just be, get resent to them at that appropriate time. Actually really, really easy to implement with a smaller marketing automation rule. Really, really effective. It's adding thousands and thousands of pounds onto weekly revenue with that and really straightforward thing to do. Users really, really appreciate it. It's just another simple trick for staying top of mind with users. So one of the things that um, I, I guess applies to, to all digital channels, um, but specifically with email, this thing I want to talk to you next. I don't know if um, anyone recognizes this handsome chap. It's a prize if anyone can tell me who, who he is. No, absolutely no one. Um, it's called first Viscount Leverhulme. He's also called William Lever, um, founded uh, Sunshine Soap, amongst other things. Um, and he's the guy who came with this quote. Um, I know half my advertising isn't working, I just don't know which half. And the really beautiful thing about email is that you can know. And you can know precisely and you can know who as well. It's one of the few channels that will give you the who. So the key thing uh, with email, if you really want to get the most out of it, is to test everything that you possibly can. Um, and email is, email is great for this. Um, as I say, it's, it's the only digital channel you've got where you can definitively know which people are doing which things and how this is affecting your tests. With everything else, you can do a lot of testing, but it's ultimately anonymized, so there's always a, a, a more of a degree of error there. Um, so the thing to remember is that A-B testing is, is your friend. Um, don't be afraid to use it. So A-B testing is, um, in its simplest form, basically sending to two random segments of your data, one version of your email to version A, one version to um, segment B, and seeing which gets the best results. And there are some rules to this that I'll go into uh, in a moment that you can um, utilize to make sure your campaigns are as effective as possible. Um, but the most important thing is, is always be testing. Um, if you're sending out campaigns regularly, there's always something else you can be testing and tweaking. And you will start to see the maximum returns from your email if you're really religious about testing your campaigns. Come up with a a series of things to test and to make sure that every time you're sending to your, your customers, you're using that opportunity to test. It is really important that you do it properly, though, otherwise you can start to draw the wrong conclusions from these tests, and that can derail um, all your good work. So i uh, have a quick look at how not to mess up a test. <laughs> 
First thing, really important, a lot of people get this wrong, um, is make sure you're testing one thing at a time and one thing only. Um, otherwise, you will never be quite sure um, what has the most influence on your campaign. Um, and as I'll show in a minute, it can be quite unexpected. So don't think that you can quite safely test a subject line change and a change in the copy of your email at the same time. You can't. They both interact with each other in, in really subtle ways. So make sure each time you're testing one thing and one thing only. Second is make sure you've got a large enough sample size to get meaningful results. So you need a good few thousand people in each segment that you're testing to. Um, maybe even more depending on what you're, you're trying to test through. You want to get, you know, if you're testing to try and drive transactions, you want to be getting a, a good number of transactions through before you try and draw any meaningful conclusions from your test. Um, otherwise, again, you could end up drawing the wrong conclusion from this. And really, really importantly, understand what the goal of the test is. Um, you, you can't know if it's doing well if, you, if you're going into there without a, a, an idea of what you want to do. So, are you looking to increase conversions to sales? Are you looking to increase your open rate? Are you looking to drive people through to a particular competition? Decide upfront exactly what it is that you want to test. Um, and try and get into a, a habit of, of documenting these tests as well. It will be really, really useful in the future. And another important thing, make sure that you now have enough time before you measure your results. Um, if you draw your conclusions too quickly, again, they can be swayed. So we particularly see this when people are running things like open rate tests. You need to allow 24 to 48 hours before you make a real conclusion um, about which, which one is going to win. If you leave an hour or two, there are far too many things that can, um, can skew your test results. And quite often, people will pick the wrong winner if you leave too short a time period. So try and allow as much time as you can before you really draw conclusions out of your tests. Um, as an example of, of both um, sort of testing methodology and um, how different factors can come into play, um, I'm going to take a look at um, an email campaign that was sent for um, one of our, our festival clients. Um, it wasn't actually sent for this year's, it was sent for, for last year's campaign. Um, and they wanted to work out which of their subject lines was going to be most effective for their audience. Um, so we tested three different subject lines. Um, in subject line A, um, fairly plain, boring. It was the one that's actually the control in this test. It's the one they'd use all the time. Um, subject line B, uh, a bit more engaging. Um, get to the festival this time for the ultimate festival experience. And subject C, make this summer unforgettable. Check out Exit Festival. And we were looking at um, open rate was going to be the, the key measure for this test. But actually, what this was went to show was there's actually a, a far more important psychological effect that you can derive from a subject line beyond open rate. Because actually, in, in these cases, the open rate for all these campaigns was pretty much identical. It didn't change. Um, but the really interesting thing that did differ um, was what people did next. Now, the emails that were sent to these subscribers were all identical. The only thing that changed in this test was the subject line. Again, as I said before, test one thing. And the remarkable effect was what actually happened after people opened this campaign. So the effect on the click to open rate, so the number of people who opened the campaign and then clicked through, and they were clicking through from this to actually go and, and purchase tickets, was astoundingly different. That's just over a 60% increase um, for the best performing subject line, um, purely because actually what it was doing is it was priming people before they opened the email campaign. It was sort of getting them in the, getting them in the right frame of mind to go through and find out more about this, this festival. Um, so like I say, that's... One of the reasons why it's really important to test just one thing, because if we change the, the creative as well, we would have had no idea um, what was influencing this. But here we can actually definitively say it was the subject line that was actually influencing the actions that people took as a result of this campaign. And as you can see, with a really simple test, we potentially increased the sales off the back of this by 60% from a single campaign. So it can be really, really powerful. Um, really powerful. So um, what else can you do to improve your campaign? Well. Um, Another really simple thing, but most people miss this, is to actually just look at ways that you can make things really, really easy for your customers. So talk to your customers, look at what they're doing. Why are they reading your emails? Why are they interacting with you as a brand? What is it they want to achieve? Um, a, a simple but, again, like really powerful example we saw for a, a customer lately. Um, we do this work with a, a brand called Susanna. They're a sort of high-end um, ladies' fashion wear. They dress at the Middletons, amongst other things. Um, really, really nice 
brand. Um, their emails before were, were not so great, so we stepped in to, to give them a hand. And we actually we sat down and talked to them, and it was like, well, what do your, what do your customers do in response to your email campaigns? And part of it is they go through and they look at the online store. Part of it is driving people um, into store to go and purchase from them directly. But another really, really important channel for them is actually the blogger network and people on Pinterest who are, I mean, these are like sort of considered purchases. These are not, not uh, this is not cheap fashion. So people tend to create their own sort of lookbook and they'll go back and they'll buy later. Um, but really important for them is this whole sort of word of mouth, people becoming aware of the the, uh, the brands that are around, um, you know, the, and what we found is that people were taking these images and they were putting them onto their, their blog, um, they were putting them onto Pinterest, but previously with their email campaigns, that was actually really, really hard. Um, there was no easy way for them to get a nice, high-quality um, image to go and, and post up on, on their site. So all we did um, was this. We added a, a link to download a high-res image below each product in the email campaign, um, and I, I actually met with um, uh, the woman who runs this. Is, is, strangely called Susanna, um, and she said that the week we sent this email out, they doubled their sales um, over this, directly attributable to this, just because of the pass-on effect, because we made it easy for people to spread the word with this. Again, a really, really simple change that just actually reflected how customers were really using their, their email campaigns. Um, it, it cost next to nothing to make that change, but the actual impact on the revenue generated from this campaign was enormous. So really, really um, important to understand what your customers are trying to achieve and then just make it easy for them. Um, again, it's all, it's all about that sort of personal level of, of interaction. Um, other things that are sort of simple techniques for you to use. So it's becoming increasingly easy to look at things like um, basket recovery email campaigns. They're really worth uh, looking into if your, um, your e-commerce store supports it. Um, but again, really importantly, you do it in the right way. Um, this is one of those things where it is really easy to get it wrong. Um, so a traditional basket recovery campaign sort of best practice is an hour or so after someone has um, abandoned their, their shopping basket in your e-commerce store, you want to send them a, a reminder email. Um, you really don't want to include any kind of discount in that initial reminder email. You really just want to make it a prompt for them to go back and complete their purchase. Because if you start including a discount in that reminder email, your users learn quickly, and they will do that every time. They will add stuff to their basket, and they will wait for the reminder email that gets them the 10% off or the free shipping, and they will do that every time. So you don't want to, um, you don't want to go down that route. Um, you can then, if they don't convert to a purchase, probably 24 to 48 hours later, that's when you want to send your next reminder email. And there you can start to, to look at a discount. Maybe it's some free shipping. It's, it's a light sort of discount, but again, another subtle reminder. Um, and then you probably want to wait um, to about seven days after they've abandoned the basket. If they haven't purchased by that point, you're going to have to pull out the, sort of, the big guns to actually get them in and, and make a purchase. So at that point, you can start to look at a, a more serious discount um, and see if you can close, close the, the purchase loop at that point. Um, again, it's a really powerful technique. Once you've set it up, um, generally depending on your store, you can set up that campaign, um, run a few tests, and then once you've found a, a method that works for you, you can leave it running and it will just help add those incremental few percentages to your sales. And again, it can be a really, really powerful technique. It's one that you can set up and just leave running. Um, really, really well worth um, analyzing. Um, and another thing that people frequently get wrong is um, frequency of their campaigns in general as well. So after you've sent your welcome email, you've got people really engaged with you as a, a brand. You know, they, they've come through and they've either completed that, the steps you've taken in the welcome email or they've made a purchase from you, which is why they've ended up on your list. Um, don't leave it three months before you contact them again and then wonder why everyone's complaining and unsubscribing from your list. Um, you don't have that long a, a window to remain relevant in your consumer's mind. So you need to be maintaining regular contact. Um, again, it's really important that you have something to say and something that's worth saying, but you need to find something on at least a monthly basis or your users will forget who you are. Um, we still, I mean, we have customers come to us on a regular basis who say, well, I've got this database that, of customers that I acquired and uh, we haven't contacted them for 18 months and can we go out and mail to them? And the answer is no. <laughs> no, you can't. Um, for two reasons. One, they won't necessarily remember who you are, why you opted in, but uh, two, it's actually um, legally on, under the, the data protection laws. Now, if you haven't contacted those people within 12 months, you can't go back and recontact them. You have to get them to re opt in again. And, that's for a very, very good reason, because you will see it time and time again, um, that your database ages really quickly. People very rapidly forget why they're on your list. And the damage that can occur to your, your brand if you leave it that long can really be quite substantial. 
So really, really important that um, you maintain regular sort of valuable contact with your, your user base. Um, make it something you, you set in your diary and do on a regular basis, because what you'll also see is that your incremental revenue from those email campaigns will increase as, as people um, get to know your brand, interact with you more. You know, if you've got things that they can buy off you on a, on a regular basis, staying in there and, and really working on those campaigns on a regular basis can make a huge difference, a huge impact on your, your bottom line. So it's something that you, is really worth investing the time in. Um, that's all of my, my sort of pre-prepared um, stuff. As I say, if you, if you uh, tweet us um, on at sign up two and, and you include the, the hashtag here, we will send you a copy of, of these slides um, with all of the stats and things in there. Um, but um, I guess I've got about 10 minutes to take any questions if anyone's uh, got yeah, anything they'd like was, to ask. Uh, that was really good then, mate.